Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome members, the Cabinet Secretary, her officials and those joining us online to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's ninth meeting of 2020. This is the first meeting the committee has conducted remotely and it will feel a little different. It is challenging times and we appreciate that staff and government, the agencies and the third sector are working in very difficult circumstances to continue to protect our environment during the current health crisis. Before I begin, I'd also like to thank the broadcasting team from the Parliament on behalf of the committee for making this meeting possible. Um, I would like to say that if there are any technical issues, which we don't anticipate, um, if we do have any technical issues, what we will do is suspend and uh, deal with those technical issues. And then if people watching online just uh, wait and we will come back once they have been resolved. So now on to the first item on our agenda today, and that's to take evidence on the two draft regulations setting up a deposit and return scheme for Scotland and making the provision for enforcement. I'm pleased to welcome Rosanna Cunningham, the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. And the Cabinet Secretary is joined remotely by Don McGilvery, the Deputy Director of Environmental Quality and the Circular Economy Division of the Scottish Government, and Emily Freeman, Solicitor for the Scottish Government. I refer members to papers one and two, which include a link to the draft regulations and related documents, and to subsequent correspondence between the Cabinet Secretary and the Committee. Now, I understand that the Cabinet Secretary would like to make an opening statement before we move to our questions. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, convener. Um, can I just say first off that I'm really grateful for all the work that's been done uh, over the piece on these uh, uh, work of the committee, the clerks, uh, and of course uh, now uh, also the broadcasting team in rather different circumstances than were first envisaged. Um, the regulations that we're discussing today um, are going to create an ambitious deposit return scheme for Scotland. Um, they have benefited a lot from the refinement uh, that we've been able to put in place since last September, and that was in direct response uh, to engagement with the implementation advisory group, um, suggestions that were made through consultation and the committee's report and recommendations. Um, we've been through quite a rigorous process uh, to ensure that we have a scheme that will be effective from day one. Uh, and we worked very closely with stakeholders, including retailers, producers, and wholesalers, to arrive at the go live date in the regulations of 1st July 2022. And this date was subject to a range of external assurance, including testing with industry representatives with experience of delivering similar schemes in other countries. And the decision to extend go live uh, to uh, July 22 was taken before we knew the impact of COVID-19 would have on all our daily lives. But we took the view that it will provide much needed flexibility for businesses to respond to the pandemic uh, as well. And clearly and rightly, that is a priority for many in industry, as indeed it is for the Scottish Government. But I do believe that proceeding with the passage of the regulation will help give industry the clarity and certainty they do need uh, to begin planning for DRS uh, we will, of course, however, monitor developments and the impact of COVID-19 closely. And as everybody will recognise, it's a um, fast-changing environment within which uh, we are currently operating. Scotland's DRS will include uh, glass. This reflects what I believe is a cons consensus that the scheme should be as comprehensive as possible, as the committee set out in its own report. And I believe that it's uh, uh, DRS is the best option that we do have to significantly increase the amount of glass that we recycle, to cut our emissions and take harmful glass litter out of our environment. Now, we've listened very carefully to the concerns of small producers, and I do believe the final regulations ensure they will not be disadvantaged by DRS. In particular, I agree with the principle that the smallest producers should be exempt from the fee to register with SEPA. The de minimis based on the VAT threshold should see 1,600 producers exempted in this way. Small producers will also benefit from the extended go-live date. Successful passage of these regulations will be a very 
uh, pivotal moment for the implementation of DRS, as it will mark the point at, at which responsibility for delivery will start to transfer from government to industry. And as you know, a coalition of major drinks producers and trade bodies plans to apply for uh, approval as a scheme administrator. Reaction from industry so far has been broadly positive. And while again recognising the, the severe pressures on industry arising from COVID-19, I am heartened by the progress is being shown towards the establishment of a scheme administrator. Um, we will, of course, continue to work very closely with industry to take forward this next stage of work to deliver a successful DRS for Scotland. Thank you, Cabinet Thank Secretary. You. I'd like to open up um, questions um, by just asking a general question. You, you've alluded to some of the changes that you've made to the regulations as a result of um, working with stakeholders and also in response to, to our correspondence with you, not least the the, the long lead-in time uh, change. Um, can I ask um, what other significant changes you have made to the regulations as a result of stakeholder uh, engagement and perhaps um, some of the correspondence that has come from this committee? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there is um, more than half a dozen changes that have been made. Some are obviously more significant than others. and The most significant one is probably the shifting uh, of the go live date, um, which I have already uh, alluded to. Um, uh, there is also the issue of registration fee, which I have uh, spoken about in the opening comments. There are one or two other things. Um, the, for example, uh, uh, we have amended the regulations to allow return point operators to refuse a return if they think that the number of containers uh, that is being brought back uh, is disproportionately greater than the number that they would have sold in any single average transaction. Um, we've uh, uh, talked about, we've changed, the, we've removed the requirement for relevant producers to pay a deposit to a scheme administrator for each container placed on the market, uh, and that uh, um, uh, uh, we've adjusted the regulations around that uh, to allow flexibility. Uh, the issue of the deposit paid from producers to the scheme administrator, um, uh, uh, the previous regulations required payment uh, to any scheme administrator of 20 pence uh, uh, for every single used drinks container placed on the market. Um, uh, we assume that 90 per cent of those funds will be used to reimburse deposits, with the remainder being used to fund the operating costs of the scheme. Um, there is consultation with producers for return point exemptions, um, so there is now a duty for Scottish ministers to take into account uh, whether, if the exemption is granted, it would significantly impair the ability of a producer or a scheme administrator to meet collection targets. Um, and we've, um, we've included a review of the regulations no later than October 26. Um, that wasn't requested by any stakeholders, but we did think that it uh, was something that might be appropriate just to provide reassurance uh, that the effectiveness of the system uh, is going to be monitored and considered and indeed changed if necessary. Um, so the regulations don't prevent a, a review before that uh, if that is considered necessary, um, but uh, we are saying no later than that date. Thank you. And, and one other question before I move on to my colleagues. Um, it goes without saying we are in the middle of uh, a global emergency in terms of the COVID-19 response. Can I ask um, why the Cabinet Secretary and the Government have decided to move forward with these regulations? Um, uh, uh, many people will be asking you know, why we are progressing this this time. You mentioned giving um, the sector certainty about what is going to happen. And of course, in the background of all of this, we do have obviously still a climate emergency which we need to adapt um, our, our, our way of life to. Could the Cabinet Secretary maybe just um, answer to, to that? And obviously, across government, some uh, uh, serious decisions had to be made about what parliamentary business uh, was appropriate to take forward um, and uh, what. Uh, did not necessarily fall into that category, and there were different uh, uh, reasons in terms of each of the uh, specific uh, items. 
Um, from our uh, um, uh, for our from our purposes for these uh, regulations, um, I think it was important uh, that, uh, but it's important I think for the committee to know, of course, that there is a very mixed reaction to some of this. There are there are those who who um, who, who would want the whole thing to be going much faster um, uh, than than the regulations uh, are now saying. So there isn't a unanimous view out there about this. Um, uh, I accept and I understand uh, why some people might say, why are you doing it at the moment? But we, we can't suspend all uh, non-COVID related business and Parliament is taking forward uh, quite a bit of business. And this was one uh, piece of business which was quite far on in terms of uh, uh, where we were with it. Um, I also think delaying the passage of the regulations would allow to continue and perhaps even open up a lot more debate about a lot of aspects of it. So I think it's important that Parliament makes the decision now, um, and that is what provides the clarity um, as we move on from this. Um, yes, of course, there are still issues that we will have to address and, and monitor as we move, and depending on what happens in terms of COVID-19, uh, there may have to be uh, 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 another look at some aspects of it, um, but we couldn't really uh, see a, a practical reason not to simply lay the regulations, because by the time we were in that position of laying the regulations, most stakeholders, regardless of their views of DRS, were well aware of where we are, what we were doing, and what was being planned. Thank you very much. I'm now going to move on to questions on the timing and introduction of the implementation. And I'll come first to Finlay Carson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as we've already stated, uh, the, the suggested proposed delay to DRS implementation to July 2022 um, was associated with the pandemic. However, you have corrected that and said that uh, you had considered delaying it prior to that. Um, it's highly uh, likely that uh, lockdown will change the face of retailing and distribution, uh, and businesses are facing unprecedented uncertainty, and that's likely to continue sometime into the future. So, why, given the fact that the new proposed launch date is almost five years after the First Minister first announced a Scottish deposit return system? Is there the urgency to push through these measures in the face of such uncertainty? Necessarily use the words urgency and push through. I think what we, uh, where we were in terms of the progress of these measures, uh, was uh, such that we were uh, literally within weeks of them being laid. Um, the, the argument then would really be, is, is it an overwhelming case to delay the laying of the regulations? And I didn't, uh, and I didn't think there was. We, we took the view that uh, um, in these circumstances, most stakeholders, as I indicated earlier, uh, regardless of their views of DRS, understood very clearly uh, uh, where we were. Laying the regulations, getting them through Parliament, allows for that simply to be uh, quite clear and unambiguous. The issue now, of course, is whether or not uh, and in what way we, we, we can, can progress at what speed. Um, and that's you know, where the July 2022 date um, allows that longer time scale uh, to, uh, uh, to be brought in play. And I notice that some people think that the time scale should have been kept at uh, 2021. I suspect that would have created considerably greater uh, concerns than the 2022 uh, go live date. So, um, you know, it's it's uh, from from our perspective, um, as as with every decision that got made by government about what should and should not proceed uh, in in terms of parliamentary business, um, it was a question of uh, weighing pros and cons. And in this uh, set of circumstances, the pros outweighed the cons. Okay, thank you. What I'll do, I've got two further questions, but I, I'll roll them into one to, to make it uh, easier in this situation. Um, given that you know it's clear that we don't understand the long-term economic impacts, why uh, don't uh, does the cabinet secretary not think it would be prudent for the Scottish government to allow itself greater flexibility and scope to react to the market after the crisis, 
Um, we have got uh, some uh, members of industry uh, asking uh, and, and suggesting that we need to revisit uh, the situations like looking at uh, how the packaging material might change, how recycling rates, uh, online sales, uh, financial impact might all change uh, due to the, the, the current lockdown, uh, and delaying the, the, the instruments uh, to perhaps the autumn might give the, the government uh, greater flexibility to impugn is fit for purpose on day one and, and up and running on the, the opening uh, uh, day back in, in, in July. Uh, my, my final question is also, the majority of businesses and industries involved in the new DRS scheme has voiced a concern about uh, Scotland introducing a Scotland-only DRS scheme, and Northern Ireland and Wales have opted to wait for the introduction of a UK scheme. With the delay in start date for Scotland, this could mean that the Scottish and the UK schemes could be ready round about the same time. Um, could you uh, give me some suggestion that if this was the case, would the Cabinet Secretary still opt for a Scotland only scheme, given that we know there is significant additional cost and disruption that it, it bring in a Scottish standalone scheme uh, means to business? Well, some of those uh, concerns um, have been getting expressed right from the get go, so they're not uh, they're not new. Um, you know, we we know that there uh, were some people who would have had us not move ahead at all until uh, Westminster chose to do so, and you know, we we made our decision for a variety of different reasons, not least of which. Um, is the other big thing which we can't simply put off uh, indefinitely, which is uh, the reacting to climate change. So there are, you know, there are things that are going to happen as a result of the current crisis, which we will obviously be looking at very carefully right across uh, um, uh, uh, society um, and the economy. Um, and you know, I, I think being clear about the introduction of the deposit return system. Is part of that conversation as well, and we can't simply um, imagine that that can all be put on hold. It, it can't all be put on hold, uh, and I don't think it should all be put on hold. Um, with respect to the Westminster um, proposals, um, they have already, as far as I'm aware, suspended the Environment Bill, which is where the the proposal uh, lies. I, I have no idea. Um, what uh, um, their intentions are in respect of deposit return. I have no information about any detail of what they are or are not looking at. Um, and to effectively tie ourselves to a situation as uncertain as that, um, I think would be um, letting down people in Scotland. Um, and it also, to be perfectly honest, makes a bit of a mockery of devolution because you know, this is a decision that we are in a position to be able to make. We we can uh, make choices about how we go about making it. We can align it with other things, for example, the uh, climate change uh, um, uh, situation that we've got to address. And I remind everybody that we have to address it um, uh, five years earlier than the rest of the UK. So taking all that into consideration, simply saying that we were prepared to delay this to uncertain uh, future with a timescale about which we know nothing uh, and a variety of mights and coulds and ifs, I don't think is responsible government. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And, um just confirm from Finlay that he's uh, asked all his questions on this theme before I move on. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, can I just confirm Finlay, that you want uh, to come back? Yeah, thank you, convener. Just finally, um, thank you for for those responses. Uh, can I ask if if there is any contingency planning? For a time where there possibly could be uh, before J July 2022, the situation where uh, the UK government have a scheme uh, ready to go, would you consider uh, working with Westminster to, to bring uh, in a, a UK-wide scheme given the, the delay? 
Well, as I indicated, I have absolutely no information whatsoever that there is any movement uh, on a Westminster scheme at present. Um, um, and unless they pull something out of the hat in, very, in the very short term uh, with an identical or near uh, uh, identical uh, go live uh, um, date, um, then I'm not sure how fruitful that conversation would be. But if they should do that, if that is uh, what their intention is, if they decide that uh, um, the July 2022 date uh, is is a reasonable one from their perspective, um, and uh, you know, in those circumstances, of course, we'd be happy to discuss it with them. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we'll now move on to questions on the timing and implementation from Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and to your officials. Um, I've listened to you um, during the measures now, and want to explore this a bit further with you, if I may. Um, do you um, recognise that there are concerns about considering this SSI during the lockdown when many businesses of all sizes are struggling, some indeed for their very survival? And do you not agree with me that it could be preferable um, to consider um, withdrawing it or delaying it, um, depending on parliamentary arrangements, and bring it back as soon as possible post-virus? I am very supportive of the scheme in principle, as is Scottish Labour. And that there would, in my view, still be plenty of time to implement the scheme before July 2021, um, sorry, 2022. Um, and in this way, I, in my view, the Scottish Government and all who have put so much work into shaping the scheme would be really positive about it, rather than feeling, as I do at the moment, it could well be a further concern for businesses. Um, and some of whom could well regard the introduction at present as somewhat insensitive. Thank you. Well, I, I know that uh, Claudia Beamish is very supportive of the, uh, um, the deposit return scheme uh, and the introduction of one for Scotland. Um, and I hear what she says, um, because, of course, I've heard um, uh, some uh, and, and seen some of the letters and, and understand um, uh, some of the arguments, but I, I think perhaps is underestimating the difficulty that might arise um, if we leave open um, uh, the substantive issues by not laying the regulations at this point. Um, uh, at, you know, committing ourselves to laying them at some uncertain point in the future, because neither she nor I, nor indeed any of us, understand when you know this COVID emergency will quote be over unquote, um, and I wouldn't like to guess at what point it would be considered in those circumstances by those who are criticising this move to be an appropriate point. The 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 July 2022 uh, date is is based on the what we consider to be the reasonable time. Uh, to uh, uh, to get that scheme up and running. The longer we leave it to lay the regulations, the longer we leave that uncertainty hanging in the air, um, the, the increasing likelihood there is of that July 2022 date um, slipping away as well. And I know that Claudia Beamish wouldn't want to see that. So again, this is a kind of balance balancing argument here about um, about how we how we manage that 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 process, um, and we have made um, some decisions, and and you know these, these decisions um, uh, 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 are made taking everything into consideration, and including some of the changes that we made without having been asked to make them. Um, and I am absolutely uh, uh, understanding that this will not satisfy. Everybody across the board, equally as Claudia Beamish knows, there are um, voices very critical about some of the changes we've made um, and who would have tried to hold to next year as a go live date, which I don't think would have been at all realistic in the current circumstances. So, all in all, while I do understand Claudia Beamish's support for the scheme, um, I think she's underestimating the difficulties that there would be uh, by delaying these regulations to a completely uncertain point in the future. 
um, and then trying to hold the July 2022 date, um, even supposing it didn't allow for extended debate about the um, the, the detail, uh, other detail within the regulations. For the Abhimesh? Um, I'll, I'll allow you to move on. No, thank you. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, sir. And now to questions from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, convener. I've just got a brief follow-up question uh, on timetable. And what I'm interested in is we're holding to the 1st of July 2022 as the date. What actually would be the effect of not taking the decision that's before us today, today, um, given that we're holding to the implementation date? Well, that simply not make worse for manufacturers who have to address labelling issues and for retailers who have to start to consider what infrastructures they may need by compressing the amount of time in which they have to make that decision making. Isn't it all the more urgent that the government bits of this plan, the legislation, the secondary legislation, is put in place as early as possible so that the maximum amount of time and effort is available to uh, the players who are actually going to have to make it work on the ground. And that's the end of my questioning, Convener. The, the short answer to that, I suppose, is, is yes. Uh, and in a sense, it's what I was saying at the outset, which is basically that, you know, laying these regulations at this point um, sets out with absolute clarity what now needs to happen. Um, and that's what's important that that everybody across the board understands uh, what what absolutely needs to happen now. Um, and that July 2022 date does allow uh, a period of time, uh, a period of uh, of of continued uh, discussion about some of the issues which have given rise to some uh, to some concerns. Um, but allows us to have a scheme which is effective and does command public confidence from day one, and that's really, really important. Um, uh, so, you know, we have been working with industry uh, on this, um, and we will continue to work with industry. Oh, it's a really important thing for us to say that the the, um, the engagement will not cease, um, and I would anticipate that the committee's engagement will not cease either. Uh, uh, as we move through this process, um, so uh, you know we continue to monitor um, uh, developments, and we will do that throughout this. But uh, laying the regulations now gives us that absolute clarity, which is what I think is needed uh, to move on to the next stage, however and in whatever way that next stage uh, takes place. Thank you. And now two questions from Mark Ruskell. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I think we'd all anticipated that there would be several months of delay for the implementation date, but 15 months is a, is a really long time scale. And I think you said in your opening remarks that you'd been testing that time scale with some industry representatives. Um, that industry representatives that had experience of delivering schemes elsewhere. But we also know that some countries have rolled out deposit return schemes within six months. You also said that the scheme administration um, requirements were, were making steady progress as well, the discussions with various industry groups. So I, I'm trying to understand why you've chosen a delay of 15 months for the implementation. You know, what are the reasons that have been put to you as to why we need a 15-month delay. Is it about setting up the scheme administrator? Is it about building infrastructure? So I think as a committee, we're still struggling to understand why the exact date has been chosen. Clearly not COVID-related, but if it's not COVID-related, what is it? How is that 15-month timescale, that delay, uh, being, being arrived at? Um, well, um, as I recall the way the discussion uh, um, went, and uh, it is possible that John McGilvery might want to uh, uh, elaborate, um, he may not, um, uh, that, that it, it was more about 
at what point in a year is, is a go live day appropriate um, in terms of what else is happening in any one year? So if you if if you move it by only a couple of months, that doesn't really uh, extend realistically uh, the preparation time. Uh, if if you go into a period, for example, in the run up to Christmas or or whatever, when when there's a lot else happening, that then becomes a, a, an issue as well. So it was more about trying to scope out those points um, in 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 a, a year where that really didn't work. Um, and July date. Um, uh, uh, seem to be the most sensible placing in a year uh, for that to for that to go ahead, um, uh, and and it wasn't really that we we measured out 15 months. It was about choosing um, a sensible and appropriate point in the year that it would work, um, because uh, it was clear to us with all the discussions with stakeholders that the original. Day, which I had very much set my heart on, but you know clearly simply wasn't going to work in terms of the the logistics. Was that that date was going to have to be moved? But if you were going to move it, then you were moving it into later in the year, um, and that started to run into other difficulties as well. Um, so it was more that kind of conversation um, than uh, you know pinning a particular day and month on the calendar. So I don't know whether or not Don uh, wants to elaborate on that, or whether he feels that basically is the is is the explanation of where we why we ended up where we did. Yeah, um, the, the only things I would add to that, I think I think the CAPSEC has covered um, many of the bases there. The only thing I would add to that is that um, the critical path we found was the time it takes. To um, in, in the large retail sector, particularly to install, to do the planning, the design, procurement, the installation of you know a very large number of reverse vending machines. Um, we have a particular structure of the retail sector in Scotland, um, and our analysis was that the critical path is getting in place that big return uh, point infrastructure, um, and, and that was the driver for the extension of the timescale. The risk of, uh, I'm sure members will understand the risk of not having sufficient return point infrastructure in place. You know, if, if the return point infrastructure isn't there, isn't sufficient, then um, it would have a major effect on the operation of the scheme. So it's about having confidence that that scale of return point infrastructure is in place for day one. Um, the other countries that have done it in six months, when we've looked at that in more detail um, in terms of the level of infrastructure that was really in place in those kind of timescales. Um, it's uh, it's not a situation that we believe would uh, um, provide an effective system in Scotland from day one. Thank you. Mark, do you have any more questions on this theme or would you like to move on to talking about the rate of deposit? Um, I have a, just a, a quick follow-up, convener. Um, I mean, I think that brings a little bit more clarity, uh, but I'm still trying to understand: is this a problem that we don't have enough reverse vending machines, or we won't be able to get enough reverse vending machines uh, within 12 months, or is it a problem about planning, about companies getting planning permission, putting in RVMs and storage facilities at shops? I'm not really clear why this is an issue. For the next 15 months, and and how that will be resolved necessarily after 15 months. Um, I also wanted to ask about what the climate impact will be of the 15 month delay. Is that something the government has worked out? So to be clear, well, from my um, Mark, carry on, cabinet secretary. Um, I, you know, we haven't made a, a precise calculation. Um, of the difference the uh, 15 month ma uh, 15 months makes in terms of uh, 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 climate change, uh, no. Um, obviously, uh, a delay, as I said right at the start. You know, my heart was set on the earlier date, and Don will tell you that that was the case. Um, uh, but uh, I, I had to accept um, the reality of uh, of where we are. Um, just as we will all have to accept the reality of where we are after this current. Emergency. 
Um, in, in terms of the, the broader question, um, I think uh, um, it, it wasn't so much about planning permission. It was more about the actual logistics of just physically getting the 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 the, the setup organised uh, on the on the the sort of timescales that would have been required if we had stuck to the original date, um, and ensuring um, that we were in a position so that the, the the big retailers who who are probably the ones who are going to be you know picking up the majority uh, of this um, were able to do so. Um, uh, over over that longer period of time. Mark, would you like to move on to the next theme, which is the rate of deposit? Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, we've had uh, a lot of uh, discussion with uh, stakeholders about this issue. Um, I mean, it does still seem a little illogical that you have the same deposit for a 150 mil, you know, can of tonic, um, the same deposit as a as would also be levied on a three liter soft drinks bottle. Um, I think you know the, the government obviously is is where it is with the the current um, regulations that are before us, and the 20p is is the 20p it applies across all bottles and cans. But I'm just wondering what discretion there might be for the scheme administrator going forward potentially as the scheme gets reviewed, uh, to look at that issue of the variable deposit, if that was something which they uh, they believed would make sense in terms of incentivising particular consumer behaviours and reflecting the resources that are used in, in different types of uh, drinks, bottles and cans. Um, I mean, we, we took the view that the flat rate deposit was the correct approach, particularly the introduction. Uh, stage because we, you know, remember quite a big behavioural change in terms of population, and the 20p just seemed psychologically to be a simple and straightforward, um, uh, easily graspable uh, um, thing. Now, um, I, uh, I, I think that um, uh, um, uh, to, to talk about variable um, uh, deposit, it, it is entirely possible. Uh, the, the, the scheme will be subject to a review, as I've indicated, um, and uh, uh, that is to be no later than five years uh, after it commences. And of course, the deposit amount it can be part of that review, and whether or not a variable deposit should be applied to that process. So there have been one or two suggestions that the, vari that the, the flat rate might uh, push um, consumers into a, a, a different purchasing options. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not as convinced of that as, 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 as many people say, because people's decisions about purchasing are driven by quite a lot of different things. Um, and uh, I think I've talked about that before um, in committee. Um, but, but it is absolutely open that that can be part of uh, the review. Um, and I'm, I just say that the changing the deposit level would uh, require a negative instrument in Parliament. So it would not be a, a, a hugely difficult thing to do if it was decided um, uh, after a year or two that, that the whole thing was ve well embedded psychologically and in terms of behavioural change, that we could then perhaps think about moving to a variable deposit. But I think that at the start, for some of those other reasons, the, the flat rate is a sensible one um, to uh, to begin with. Mark, do you have any more questions on this theme, or can I move on? Thank you. Um, Annie Wells. Good morning. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, just following on from Mark Ruskell's question there, if the switch to plastic does occur, as it seems likely to do so, we will drive customers towards more plastic use. How does it help the environment to have more consumers buying plastic? Well, I don't agree that that's necessarily the case. Um, and you know, there's different experience in different countries, so there's uh, a lot more involved in the provisions uh, than simply the effectively one-off deposit on the first purchase of something. Um, so I, I think there uh, uh, there would be an interesting 
uh, conversation to be had with uh, Annie Wells, um, and this was something that the committee obviously um, thought about as well. Um, I, I, I don't believe uh, um, that that people make their purchasing decisions purely, uh, or will make their purchasing decisions purely on the point of uh, that first purchase, um, and uh, uh, that is something that a review uh, could consider if uh, if if there. If the, in the unlikely event that there was seen to be a shift in uh, in purchasing behaviour, um, but as I've indicated, there isn't strong evidence that that is what happens, um, and there are lots of very good arguments that most people are now accepting um, about plastic that are more about um, a qualitative argument rather than the quantitative one that is involved in a flat rate 20p deposit. Annie, do you have any other questions before I move on? No, that's fine. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Right, we now move on to uh, questions from Claudia Beamish on cross-border issues. Claudia. Thank you, convener. Um, could I seek clarification from you, Cabinet Secretary, on the arrangements for home delivery of grocery shopping to homes in Scotland, where the supermarket they come from is England? Um, for example, um, a number of people in Dumfries and Galloway will do online grocery shopping with supermarkets such as Asda, and the nearest Asda supermarket um, is in Carlisle. So I've given that as an, as an example, although there are others. Um, so where, um, so that is where their shopping will come from. So um, the point that's been raised um, with myself as a South Scotland MSP and my colleague Colin Smith is that. Products delivered to homes in Dumfries and Galloway borders through online shopping, where the supermarkets based in the north of England, will they have to have the deposit apply, applied as they are ordered from Scotland and delivered to Scotland? Um, and uh, just sort of further on from that, so that I ask it all at once, um, how would um, constituents deal with their recycling if not? Um, as there are some places without curbside recycling. So it might sound a bit niche, but it is a concern for people in South Scotland. Thank you. Um, well, our, our view is that there will be um, uh, um, uh, drinks bought in England. People, and I understand what the, 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 the member is saying, but for some people, Carlisle might be their closest big supermarket. But if they buy um, uh, uh, drinks in England when they do their grocery shopping, or indeed they're delivered, they won't be subject to the deposit, um, and but then they will not be returnable to the Scottish deposit return scheme, which is what I assume is what leads on to the second part of the question. Um, uh, uh, people shopping south of the border will still have access to their own normal uh, recycling services to dispose of used packaging. Uh, responsibly, um, and uh, um, I, I, the council uh, may want to monitor for a while what what that looks like in terms of uh, uh, of continuing uh, um, uh, you know bottles being put into the uh, the ordinary recycling services. Um, but 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 this is a kind of relatively. I, you know, I, I wouldn't use niche, perhaps, which is what Claudia Beamish used, but this is a, a relatively small percentage of the of the of the purchasing population. And um, you know, there were some. The, 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 I would imagine people who habitually um, shop south of the border will just continue to do so. Um, we don't anticipate there being any increase. There wasn't really an increase in terms of minimum unit pricing either. So. Um, uh, we don't think DRS is going to have any other impact um, than simply that there is a small number of people who will be doing some of their shopping south of the border. But then, um, you know, um, I, I, you know, for for each household, um, there will probably be a mix of it. There will be, you know, some shopping brought in from south of the border, another more locally, uh, another shopping more locally. So it won't be everything that they buy. Um, will be um, exempted from the deposit return. I mean, you know, border issues, cross-border issues happen everywhere. There are slightly different schemes on either sides of borders, so we're not dealing with anything unusual or particularly different here. 
sorry, was there any other part to that question that I've missed? Would it be possible for me to just oh add something to that, Cabinet Secretary? Well, it's the carry on, not me. I, I don't be happy to hear. But I, I just wanted to clarify one thing um, there. So what the Cabinet Secretary said there in terms of if you drive to a store in Carlisle and buy the product in the store in Carlisle, the deposit will not be charged. Uh, the clarification, though, is that if you order an online grocery shopping from Asda and it's delivered to an address in Scotland, the, the delivery will be charged. So if it's an Asda grocery delivery shop or uh, any other kind of postal delivery, even if it's, if it's sent from whatever, if it's for a, a sold to a consumer, an address in Scotland, the deposit will be chargeable. I just wanted to make that clear. Claudia, you wanted to come back in. Uh, I, I think that's uh, actually to say on that point. So if it's appropriate, convener, I could ask my other question, which I think, um, um, but I'll wait for your guidance. <laughs> yes, so Claudia, if you could move on to asking your questions about uh, flint glass. Right, thank you. Um, the, the, the question for yourself, Cabinet Secretary, is um, that the answers received from, from you to the committee and also to me um, from Zero Waste Scotland have been reassuring in relation to the availability of clear flint glass. Um, and for the record, I wonder if you could confirm the likelihood of an increase in this if the scheme goes ahead and why this might be the case. Well, we have said um, all along, and we, we do believe that DRS will um, significantly increase the quantity and quality of glass recycling. And I know that the glass manufacturers are particularly concerned about the clear glass um, uh, aspect of this. Um, uh, but we, we believe that uh, uh, working with them, um, we will be able to do that to significantly increase the quantity and quality of glass recycling, which is what they're um, uh, uh, wanting a significant proportion of that will be uh, clear glass. We know that's in high demand, um, and uh, discussions continue with the glass manufacturers about that. And that is another um, slight advantage of the extended uh, go live date. It allows us that slightly longer time to um, uh, uh, to talk to them about that. The code of practice for managing um, controlled waste does make it clear that the use of recovered glass cullet, which is the jargon um, term for this, uh, 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 to create new glass products is an example of high quality recycling and should be prioritised. So the best practice is not to crush it in order to achieve this or only to break it into large pieces. And that's relevant in the context uh, of DRS. Um, so we do believe that Scottish businesses can benefit from this, um, the feedstock that will be generated through DRS, um, and that in turn will maximise economic opportunities and support jobs. But that is a continuing conversation um, uh, that we are having. Um, and uh, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that a lot of recycling rates as currently stand have rather stalled um, and uh, um, it's, you know, and that includes for glass. And what we are anticipating is an 85% collection rate for glass by the third full year of operation uh, of the scheme. So uh, um, that will also increase the uh, quality and quantity uh, of the glass that the manufacturers are looking for. And uh, Finlay Carson wanted to come in on distance selling. Finlay. Uh, thank you, Convener. It's, it's to go back to, to cross-border issues. Uh, earlier in, in the sessions that we've had in the committee, there was a question over uh, the reserved uh, part of distance selling and, and the regulations would, be, would have to be changed at Westminster to ensure that uh, bottles or, or products bought online uh, had the deposit return information on. So, for example, if a consumer was to buy from a wine merchant or a beer merchant uh, south of the border, indeed, 
elsewhere uh, in, in Europe or across the world. How could the Scottish Government ensure that those bottles had the appropriate deposit return information on, uh, and would there be any uh, implication to, to uh, shopkeepers or whatever when these bottles were returned? Um, well, first of all, labelling isn't a matter for us or the regulations. That's a matter for the scheme administrator, and decisions about that will be taken by the scheme administrator. Um, uh, uh, so that's uh, important uh, to to remember. Um, and there is a tendency to want to talk about things that are actually more properly going to be for the scheme administrator to decide. Um, uh, there, uh, on, on the issue of um, uh, Westminster um, regulations, I'm not entirely certain what um, what the members are referring to. Um, I don't know if if Don has a clearer notion uh, about that, but I'm not um, absolutely clear um, what what aspect he thinks Westminster has to do in respect of this. I mean. Yeah. So, Cabinet Secretary, uh, you've. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so, you've, you've made the key point there, which is we're not trying to do anything in terms of mandatory labelling um, as part of our design of the scheme here. We are leaving that decision to the scheme administrator. If we had wanted to make a mandatory requirement for certain types of labelling, then we would be. Having to deal potentially with reserved issues, um, and, and there would be a question about the powers of the, the Scottish Parliament to do so. But because of the approach we're taking, which is leaving that decision to the system administrator, um, there's no issue of needing regulations, as, as I understand it, at Westminster. Uh, Emily will keep me right here, though. Um, she's the she's the legal brain here. You've represented that correctly, Emily. Yeah. Um, that that's Don's explained it correctly. Finley, can I move on? Uh, yes, convener. Thank you. Right now, on to collection targets and questions from Angus Macdonald. Okay, thank you, um, convener. Uh, good morning, cabinet secretary. Um, you, you'll recall, cabinet secretary, the. The question 22 in the letter uh, that was sent by the committee to you on the 26th of March, um, which asked why it was necessary and appropriate for the, the scheme to operate under a no collection target between implementation in July 2022 and the 1st of January 2023. Now, um, clearly, there's disappointment amongst environmental stakeholders that targets will not apply from the, the actual day of launch. Uh, and I think it's also fair to say um, there's disappointment at the initial target of 70%, which incidentally is 4% below the, the rate achieved by Lithuania during the first year of their system's operation. So I wonder if you could explain to us what is the justification for a six-month period of target-free operation, which some would argue undermine the, the launch period considerably, uh, and why can't targets be introduced from day one? Well, I suppose to try and um, uh, uh, um, be, be brief about it is because on day one, um, there will still be um, a considerable amount of uh, uh, product on the shelves um, that was uh, purchased and in stock um, uh, and distribution from the period official launch. So you're in a, a period where the, there would be um, potentially uh, a mix of things uh, uh, still to be still to be sold. Some attracting a deposit, some not attracting a deposit. Um, and in those circumstances, the, the the slightly complicated effort that would then be required to make uh, the assessment of what was and was not in scope, um, we decided it was simply easier to allow that. Early period um, to allow that effective changeover between uh, product that uh, um, would require a deposit and product which was still in the system that wouldn't require a deposit. It's as simple as that. Basically, it's just uh, it, it's just to allow that uh, 
effective changeover period to take place. We have to pick a launch date. Uh, uh, the, the, the date has been picked, but uh, um, anything that's uh, uh, in their in their system prior to that will not be attracting a deposit. Um, and uh, um, what is uh, brought into the system after that will be attracting a deposit. Um, was it was more straightforward for us to allow that uh, restricted six month period to allow them to see the older stock out of the system and make the complete switch over to everything uh, on their shelves requiring deposit. Okay, thank you, um, Kevin Secretary. On the seventy percent initial target, um, was there any reason why it's not more ambitious? Or is it for the same reason that you just um, outlined? It, it's 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 kind of um, a follow on, and uh, you know, uh, and let's also remember that uh, the achievement of targets depends on the behavioural change that will be required in terms of the population to um, uh, uh, to be engaging with all of this as as well. So uh, um, we just wanted to allow that to uh, work its way into the system. Okay, thank you. Um, with your permission, Convener, can I move on to my next uh, question on scope of materials? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, with regard to the, the, the scope of materials um, to be included in the scheme, um, I, I noted your earlier response to the committee um, in which you stated that Zero Waste Scotland has been out engaging with uh, carton manufacturers. Now, clearly, the inclusion of, of further materials would require uh, the making of affirmative regulations. So, um, is there a timeline for that work? And given that the new Regulation 32 creates a duty on Scottish ministers to review the operation of the regulations before the 1st of October 2026, which you alluded to earlier, um, is there scope to include, for example, uh, cartons or HDPE plastic by? Day 2024 25. Um, could that be done? Um, the review process does allow um, for a reconsideration of materials in scope. And I think I said right at the outset of this particular process that we, you know, we would be uh, looking potentially at HDPE, but um, there are some issues around that and they would require to be overcome uh, in order for that to be a successful. Uh, introduction to the materials in scope. Um, so I think it would be difficult to put a date on that at the moment because it will depend on um, the, those issues being uh, overcome. Uh, but yeah, um, we know carton manufacturers are, uh, are interested in this. Um, we will continue to talk to them about it. Um, we will continue to uh, uh, consider that. Um, an expansion to the scheme would mean further. Um, uh, uh, and if a scheme administrator chose to simply agree to expand the scheme, there wouldn't be a way to enforce its acceptance by return point. So that would be why we would want to do it by regulation. Um, uh, but as, I, as I've indicated with the review, yes, um, uh, that is one of the things any review could take uh, uh, could take on board. Um, and uh, um, you know that will continue to be an issue that is monitored, particularly with respect to HDPE. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got one uh, final quick question, uh, which perhaps is for uh, Donald McGovery, uh, and it's to do with the strategic environmental impact assessment. And um, basically, why um, will the scheme administrator not be required to publish an annual SEA? Uh, why is there, an, in effect, an, an exemption? Um, Cabinet Secretary, do you want to have a go at this first, or do you want me to speak? <laughs> you could just go ahead. Um, so um, there is a requirement uh, for the scheme administrator to provide information to CPA to, to demonstrate compliance with its obligations under the regulations. Um, so. Um, what we don't want to do is to um, um, put um, certain obligations on the scheme administrator that would tip us over into a sense of public sector 
control over the scheme administrator. So it's fair to say we've tried to keep those requirements on the system administrator to a minimum in terms of legal requirements to um, try and avoid any um, kind of risk of a sense of public sector control over that entity. Um, that said, um, I think international evidence suggests that most of the schemes are very proactive in wanting to publish information about the environmental performance of the scheme uh, to kind of push the environmental credentials and what's being achieved in terms of carbon savings and so on. Certainly, when we've gone out to visit other international schemes, that's been a key part of their pitch and their presentation to us uh, is, is um, what the environmental performance of their scheme is. So, um, it, it's a balance between uh, what we regulate for and what we think the scheme administrator will do anyway, because it's in their interest to do so. Okay, thank you, convener. Thank you very much. And we have a, a final question because um, we are running a, a little bit close to time. Um, from Finlay Carson on the focus of officials. Over to you, Finlay. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, given the, the current crisis uh, we're under, and, and, and we know the Scottish Government are working hard to, to support individuals and businesses, uh, can the Cabinet Secretary give us an indication of how many full-time equivalents are currently working on the DRS and Zero West Scotland and elsewhere in the Scottish Government? And would these civil servants not be best utilised in assisting businesses at this time of crisis to look at how they can make better decisions with regards to climate change? adaption and mitigation, uh, enable them to make cost savings and better structure their business to survive after the lockdown? Um, I can't give an exact figure of FTE um, uh, uh, numbers. Uh, I can say that there has been a very significant redirection of resources within uh, and around the Scottish Government uh, in terms of dealing uh, with, the, uh, with the current crisis. But the the question that the member is asking me, um, uh, underlying that, is an assumption that all non-COVID-related business should cease. Um, and you know, clearly, government has taken a view that that is not only not necessary, but is not desirable either. Um, so uh, we have we have uh, effectively tried to prioritise uh, uh, within my portfolio and within all portfolios. Uh, what is uh, is going to be regarded as, um, uh, and I don't want to say, uh, uh, um, you know, make it as if there was a kind of list of priorities, but those things which we felt uh, were important that we had to preserve at this particular point. Climate change is one of those. I have, you know, people still working on climate change issues uh, at the moment, particularly. In connection with the uh, uh, the need for a green economic recovery emerging uh, from this, um, but uh, once the decision was made that the deposit return uh, uh, regulations should be laid, um, the the work that was uh, uh, needed to do to finalise that. And I go back to what I said earlier in the piece that you know the the, the most of the work that was being done from the draft. Uh, the laying of the draft regulations to this period, most of it had actually already been been done, uh, and I can uh, reassure uh, uh, the member that uh, those people who are working on DRS are also working um, very hard on other aspects uh, within the portfolio as well. A number of them that are uh, indeed COVID related. Thank you. That um, probably concludes our questions. I just want to check uh, before we move on, um, have any members got any final questions they want to ask? Now is the time to make it known to me. Okay. And would the Cabinet Secretary like to make any other remarks before we conclude this part of the meeting? No, thank you, Convener. Okay, that means we'll move on to the next agenda item. Our next item today is to invite the Cabinet Secretary to move motion S5M21535 that the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommends that the deposit and return scheme for Scotland's regulations 
2020 be approved. I now invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and to move the motion. I'm very happy to move the motion. Uh, I think in the circumstances, um, speaking to it is not strictly necessary unless the convener particularly wishes me to do so. Thank you. Uh, can I remind officials that they're not permitted to speak to this agenda item? I now invite members to comment. If members don't have anything to say at this point, just indicate that you're content by nodding. And once all members wish to comment um, have done so, I'll invite the Cabinet Secretary to wind up and then I'll put the question in the motion. So could I have an indication from members if you wish to comment at this stage by raising your hand? Okay, we have I'll go in alphabetical order. So I'll go first of all to Finlay Carson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, as you know, the Scottish Conservatives are supportive of a well-designed DRS scheme, um, and we have the desire to see a fit-for-purpose and effective uh, DRS scheme from day one. Whilst we say that, we remain very concerned that stipulating a flat deposit fee, which ties the hands of the scheme administrator, will severely limit their ability to change <clears throat> excuse me, the rate in a timely manner to address uh, potential issues, including a significant increase in the consumption of plastic bottles. We also believe that, given the unprecedented ourselves in at the moment, it would be prudent for the Scottish Government to allow itself greater flexibility and scope to react to the market after the COVID-19 pandemic, because, as of yet, we do not understand the long-term economic impacts. Thank you. And we now move on to comments from Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. And uh, I want uh, to say for the record that Scottish Labour and myself have long been supportive of the Scottish DRS since the early days of its development. And I want to recognise the work and contribution of all those involved, including the Cabinet Secretary and officials and Zero Waste Scotland, as well as that of Have You Got the Bottle and the Marine Conservation Society and many businesses. Um, of course, litter by land and, and sea is, is a dangerous issue, and um, I believe the scheme will, when it does come in, uh, uh, contribute to the circular economy and, of course, to lowering our emissions. However, I, I'm very clear and have had discussions with uh, my group, my Labour group, that this is not the time with businesses struggling um, and, indeed, some failing. Um, and I hope that um, uh, it could be considered that it could be brought back or delayed um, until we're at the other side of the virus, which will hopefully be later this year, which in, in my view, um, although I'm not an expert, of course, would still give time before the July 2022 date um, for um, implementation in a, in a measured and positive way. Um, so um, I will be uh, abstaining on the, the motion, sorry, on the SSI today. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe the only other member that would like to comment is Mark Ruskell. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, I mean, this has been a very long road. Um, the, the original powers to enable government to bring in a deposit return scheme were in the Climate Act 11 years ago. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you announced your intention to bring in a deposit return scheme two and a half years ago. But you're now asking us to wait a further two years before we can actually use a deposit return scheme in Scotland. So, you know, I really feel the progress on this has been glacial, to be honest, although maybe that's a bad metaphor given that glaciers are melting rather faster these days. Uh, and I think in terms of climate change, uh, the Have You Got the Bottle campaign pointed out that the 15 month delay will result in another 60,000 tonnes of carbon emissions in Scotland, 60 million cans and bottles being unnecessarily littered and further costs for councils. Uh, I've listened carefully to what was being said by Don McGilvery and yourself, Cabinet Secretary, about the reasons for delay. Um, I hear the points made about reverse vending machines, but I, I don't understand why those weren't a consideration back in September when you originally chose the 2021 implementation date. So I'm not clear what has changed in the last six months 
On the points that were uh, uh, raised in relation to the target, um, I'm going to hear what's said about, you know, six month shelf life of cans and bottles. But it's worth bearing in mind that every other country that has launched a deposit return scheme has had targets in place for day one. So clearly they've been able to work around those shelf life issues. So I still have concerns about this regulation. Yes, we need certainty for business, but I would much prefer to see a more realistic timescale being brought in place. And I think 15 months is really kicking it far too much into the long grass. So I think for those reasons, I don't feel able to fully support this regulation that's been brought to the committee here today. And for those reasons, I will be abstaining. Thank you. Um, I would like to give the Cabinet Secretary an opportunity if she wants to wind up. Well, I don't want to rehearse everything that has been already discussed. I think I've made the, uh, our position clear. Um, uh, you know, the decision uh, about uh, uh, moving the go-live date wasn't you know, a decision taken on a particular day. There had been a conversation uh, prior to that about what a go-live date uh, should be. Um, I was keen on the earlier date, but that conversation uh, um, about go live uh, was one that we were having right from the start and continued to have. Um, and uh, um, as much as I uh, wanted to be able to do it on the earlier time scale, it became increasingly clear that that was really not going to be practical. And in those circumstances, frankly, had I overruled my officials, as I probably would have had to have done to insist on the early date, and then we did not make it, then there would have been uh, a far greater de degree of difficulty and uh, um, uh, and concern than uh, than is currently uh, the situation. So I think, you know, however uh, uh, reluctantly that shift in the go live date was uh, taken, however reluctant that decision was, um, I, I think it was the right decision. And I appreciate people. Um, being uh, frustrated by it, um, uh, but equally, we've now heard people who are going to abstain on this regulation for almost equal and opposite reasons, which I find a little um, uh, perplexing. Thank you. I'm now going to put the question on the motion. Before I do that, can I ask members that if you agree with the motion, Stay silent. If you disagree or you intend to abstain, you can indicate verbally and also by raising your hand. I now put the question on the motion. Do any members disagree with the question that motion S5M21535 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham be approved? Disagree. 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 So we are going to now, I'm going to ask members permission if we can have a roll call vote, um, which I will, means I'll go around to every individual member to indicate verbally what their uh, vote is. Are members content with me doing that? Thank you. I'll now come to each member in alphabetical order to ask if you wish to agree, disagree or abstain. And once I've asked each member, I will then announce the outcome of the vote. I'll come first of all to Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. I wish to disagree and I wish to abstain, please. Can I just confirm that you want to abstain rather than disagree? Which is it? It's to abstain. abstain. It's abstain. Thank you. Finlay Carson. Disagree. Angus MacDonald. Agree. And I am next in the roll call, and I agree. Mark Ruskell. Abstain.
Stuart Stevenson. Agree. And finally, Annie Wells. Disagree. I'll just check that again, Annie. You cut out a little bit. Could you say that again, please? Disagree. Thank you. Okay, just pause for a second for us to collate the results. Right, the results of that vote are that we have three agree, two disagree, and two abstain. That means that the committee agrees that the motion be approved and will report to Parliament. I'll just go through that again. Three agree, two disagree, two abstain. And the committee approves the motion and will report to Parliament. Thank you. So we'll now move on to our next item today, and that's to invite the Cabinet Secretary to move S5M21536 that the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommends that the Environmental Regulation Enforcement Measures Scotland Amendment Order 2020 be approved, and I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move that motion. Um, just a second, I've put papers down onto the floor. I'll need to get them up. Could you repeat the uh, the regulations that you're you're referring to now? This is yes. not the 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 this is not the DRS ones, no. So I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move S5M21536 that the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommends that the Environmental Regulation Enforcement Measures Scotland Absolutely. Amendment Order 2020 be approved. Um, uh, yes, um, I uh, want to so move. These regulations are required. This regulation is required to. Um, allow SEPA um, to do the work that we wish it to do, um, and to do so in uh, uh, a, legal, uh, a legal way. Um, uh, so these are consequential regulations um, in terms of, uh, of of DRS. So they're they're part of the uh, part of the whole. Um, uh, but they need to be done uh, separately uh, and not as part of the, uh, uh, the DRS regs for that reason. So I'd just like to confirm that you'd like to move that motion. Yes, I, I think I did move at the start, did I not? I've just been extra careful. <laughs> Thank you. I now invite members to comment if you have nothing to say at this point. Simply indicate your content by nodding. Um, if members can let me know by raising their hands if they want to comment on these regu this uh, motion. I'm not seeing anyone. Yes, I'll come to Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. And um, I, I simply wanted to say that although I abstained on the DRS SSI itself. As this has now passed, I will be supporting at the present one uh, monitoring enforcement and other issues which it, it covers, which are related, to be sure the scheme works as effectively as possible. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't see any other members wishing to comment on this, so I'll move on and ask if uh, the Cabinet Secretary would like to wind up at all. Uh, no. Convener, I think we can right. we move on. So I'll now put the question on the motion. Before I do that, if I if members um, agree with the motion, stay silent. If you disagree, then indicate verbally and raise your hand. 
I now put the question on the motion. Do any members disagree with the question that motion S5M21536 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham be approved? Okay, I'm seeing disagreement from Finlay Carson and Annie Wells, which means it will come to a, um, a vote. Again, I want to just get confirmation from members that you're happy to do a roll call vote if you just nod in agreement, if that's the case. So as before. or abstain. Once I've asked each member, there'll be a brief pause while we collate the, the votes and I'll announce the outcome of the vote. So I'll come to each member individually. Claudia Beamish. Um, agree, convener. Finlay Carson. Abstain. Angus MacDonald. Agree. I am next and I agree. Mark Ruskell. Agree. Stuart Stevenson. Agree. And finally, to Annie Wells. Abstain. Okay, we have a brief pause while we collate the results. Right, we have the results. We have in agreement five members. We have no members disagreeing and we have two members abstaining. The committee then agrees the motion to be approved and we will report to Parliament. Right, we move on to our next uh, agenda item and I just want before we move on to thank the Cabinet Secretary our officials for all that evidence on the uh, deposit return scheme. We're now going to uh, move on to the last item in our uh, public part of our agenda and that's to take evidence from the Scottish Government on the plans for the updated climate change plan and COP26. So the committee is uh, pleased to uh, here from Rosanna Cunningham, the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. And I understand that the Cabinet Secretary would like to make an opening statement before we move on to our questions on these issues. Cabinet Secretary. I just want your guidance because the um, opening statement is rather longer than you would normally expect at a committee. Um, in a sense, we're treating it as a, as a statement rather than uh, simply um, an opening speaking note. So I don't know whether or not you are content with that or you want me to try and reduce it in, in, in size. Well, Cabinet Secretary, as long as you're, you're happy to give a statement, um, we, we've got all the, the time to allow you to do whatever you need to do. Um, if you would like to just continue making your statement, I, I think I think I'll speak for all members of the committee, we would like to hear it. Okay. Um, thank you very much, convener, and uh, um, uh, thank you for agreeing to let me um, make uh, these comments uh, uh, today. Um, I mean, obviously, we are currently in um, an extraordinary set of circumstances, and and all of the focus, and understandably uh, so, um, is uh, on efforts uh, across Scotland to contain uh, um, this uh, pandemic. Um, the ongoing um, position uh, with COVID-19 means that we have to continue pr to prioritise and resource that response um, across the whole of Scottish Government. And I'm grateful 
to everybody who is directly or indirectly involved in this work, um, although it does, um, as we've touched on already and I will touch on uh, um, now, it does mean changes to a whole host of other important work. I've uh, been reflecting uh, that this week is the uh, um, first anniversary of the First Minister's declaration of a global climate emergency, and undoubtedly, uh, in normal circumstances, there'd have been a bit of a, a fanfare as we laid the update to the climate change plan uh, for this Parliament, which uh, members might recall was uh, expected on would have been Thursday, um, and uh, and then looked to the future with COP26 and a Green New Deal. Uh, amongst all the other things on the horizon. So um, I, I need to say at the outset that I and the government remain committed to Scotland's world leading climate change targets. Um, and I'm really proud of what we've achieved, uh, even in the short time since the legislation was passed last year. Um, and uh, uh, that means taking real steps towards realising our ambitions. However, it's vitally important that all of our actions over the coming weeks and months, even those in response to other global issues such as climate change, do reflect the current situation and are supportive of the national response um, to it. Um, as we reset and recover from this crisis, we will continue to lead glo uh, global climate action through the delivery of that sustainable, just and resilient recovery towards uh, net zero. And the 2019 Act also enshrines in law our commitments to a just transition, uh, one in which well-being, fair work and social justice are prioritised and no one is left behind. And in my view, these principles will also need to be absolutely central to the economic recovery from COVID-19, which I will touch on briefly uh, in a moment. Um, if I can just turn to uh, uh, other upcoming climate change business, I, I think I set out in my recent letter uh, that we do remain committed to meeting statutory reporting deadlines in relation to climate change matters wherever it is appropriate to do um, without compromising the immediate response to COVID. So this means that we do still expect to be laying the following reports in Parliament between now and the end of June. That would be an annual report on progress to the adaptation programme, which is due end of May a report on annual emissions reduction target for 2018, which would be due mid-June, and an annual report on progress to the land use strategy. Um, the timing on that one is to be confirmed. The preparation of these reports will uh, obviously be somewhat affected by reorganisation of internal capacity. However, continued servicing of such reporting does represent an element of our continued commitment to uh, climate change goals. Um, if I can turn back to postponing the climate change plan update, um, we were on track to deliver for this Thursday, the 30th of April, uh, or 29th of April, um, uh, perhaps. But um, uh, and and it was an absolute commitment that we had made to to update the climate change plan within six months uh, of the act. Much discussed uh, in the, during the committee's uh, deliberations um, at the time. Um, the planned update would have set out how Scotland would make the additional effort needed to bridge the gap uh, between the previous emissions targets and the new, more stringent, target, stringent targets, and to make up for the shortfall in 2017. But as I've written, I have now taken the decision to uh, pause the climate change plan update. Our agreed deadline was no longer feasible nor appropriate, given the challenges that we're currently facing. Um, and this reflects the need for a bit of time to ensure that the policies and proposals that we do put forward um, will reflect the new economic and social realities post-pandemic. Doesn't mean that work uh, will stop. Um, it, it, the pause um, uh, did allow for work to continue, but in recognition that we're operating in a very changed landscape. So some of you uh, were privy to discussions in the cross-party working group. Um, that I had set up. Um, as you may recall uh, from those meetings, those members who were involved in that analysis uh, by the Chief Economic Advisor and by independent sources such as the CCC was um, uh, pretty stark all about the scale of the challenge that we were setting ourselves. Um, but all of our underlying assumptions uh, must shift. Um, uh, we know that the risk to life and the expected economic impact from COVID-19 is unprecedented. 
Um, the uh, latest State of the Economy report um, uh, shows GDP in Scotland potentially falling by around 33% during the current period of social distancing, um, similar to estimates from UK and international bodies. Um, assuming disruption to business, as usual, for the next six months, uh, um, shows that UK GDP could fall by as much as 35% um, in quarter two and by 13% across 2020 as a whole. So these are pretty significant, uh, as is the potential for a rise in unemployment um, and um, a significant UK-wide deficit um, unseen, uh, I think, since World War II. So none of us can be blind to the disruption to the economy uh, uh, that has happened. Um, and that does mean that some of our assumptions about attitudes and individual behaviours may have to shift uh, as well. It's a bit too soon to say what the long term impacts will be uh, or the unintended consequences might be, but we can't proceed as if there may there will not be those long term impacts. So all the work that has been done up until now, it in a sense, is banked and we are going to repurpose it to inform thinking on a green recovery. And I have, as the committee knows, formally requested advice uh, from the CCC. I'm advised that that is likely to come. Uh, in the form of a letter in early May, and I will share that letter with the committee as soon as we receive it. We have to take some time to analyse the scale of economic and societal change um, and to think about how policies will need to be updated. We'll have to align the, uh, the, the climate change plan to the economic recovery strategy and other key strategic documents. Um, and that does mean that we have to allow for sufficient parliamentary scrutiny when the time comes. And I would like to lay an updated plan before this committee towards the end of this year, and I'd be keen to know if this reflects the committee's planning assumptions too. I mentioned the uh, cross-party working group, uh, which had provided invaluable external views to the update process. I am considering how best to uh, repurpose that group itself. Um, and other networks so that we can continue that open and very collaborative way of doing things. Um, and therefore, in those circumstances, um, I'd welcome uh, future opportunities to engage with the committee on options for that uh, recast update um, and proposals how we might work together on this. I should say something about uh, uh, postponing COP26. Um, uh, obviously, the committee is aware of the postponement. I think in the circumstances, it was probably inevitable. Most of us would have anticipated that that postponement was happening. Um, uh, I've re received assurances from Alok Sharma um, that the UK remains committed to hosting COP26 in Glasgow. Um, there is as yet no indication of when that postponed date uh, would be. Uh, but obviously, we still have a role in Scotland across the whole of the country, and particularly in Glasgow, to ensure a successful COP26, uh, whenever um, that may be. Um, the, there is a bit of a logistic issue, I think, in that so many things are now being rolled forward into 2021, so many big international events, uh, that 2021 looks like it might become quite a crowded um, calendar, uh, and I suspect that's why they've not really been able to settle on a future date. Um, initial work on the green recovery uh, uh, has started, um, and uh, uh, I just want to reassure uh, the committee that uh, uh, issues such as just transition are, are key and uh, central uh, to that. We've got to have a recovery that's resilient. Uh, we've got to be able to protect Scotland from future crises, and quite explicitly, it will have to have net zero at its heart. Um, and the committee will be updated uh, on that as we develop various uh, frameworks um, around decisions, um, both in the short, immediate, uh, short, immediate, uh, medium, and longer term. Um, just in conclusion, I, I know this is not where any of us expected to be. Um, uh, uh, goodness knows, we could hardly have envisaged the scenario that we're now having to work in, and the speed with which things change, the uncertainty around that. I very much hope that the current situation will inspire us to reimagine the challenges that our net zero ambitions have set out and recast them in a sustainable, inclusive economic recovery. 
And I note in passing that this conversation is now being had in a number of other countries and in the EU as a whole. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm now going to move on to ask some questions on that, and thank you for that comprehensive update. I, initially, I have a question. You mentioned a green recovery plan, and you're still mentioning a, a, an updated climate change plan. Are they one and the same now? Is it a case of taking the, the progress that was made in the update to the climate change plan and then embedding that in uh, an economic green recovery plan, as you put it. Are they two separate things or is that one piece of work now? No, um, the, the, there, there are two things. There's an economic recovery group that has to deal with the immediate and short term uh, fallout from this, understandably, and they are not going to be taking decisions that run counter to net zero. So they have a net zero target embedded as part of that to ensure that we don't inadvertently start taking decisions that simply um, uh, 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 ignore that. But, but I am conscious that the climate change plan update needs to be a very particular uh, uh, discrete uh, piece of work because, of course, that is um, uh, set towards a 2030 target um, as opposed to the longer term 2045 net zero target. Um, uh, so I will be working um, uh, uh, with the Economic Recovery Group. We will be understanding uh, uh, the slightly different role for each. But I didn't want uh, the notion of the climate change uh, climate change plan update to be lost completely. Um, we probably will not call it a climate change plan update now because that now looks that's that no longer really fits where we are. Um, uh, um, so I am anticipating uh, that these two things, while while they are running in parallel, are not exactly the same thing. Okay, thank you for that clarification. I'm going to move on to members have some questions. Um, first of all, we can go to Finlay Carson. Thanks, convener, and uh, thank you, cabinet secretary, for that update. Uh, it, it is much appreciated. Just can you give us a, a better indication or, or a rough indication of what format the Green Recovery Plan is likely to take? Because as we already mentioned, uh, the climate change plan has, has already changed from a, a whole new plan to an uh, appendix and then to an update. Um, so can you give us an indication of what the recovery, the Green Recovery Plan is likely to look like? Uh, not in detail. We haven't set out uh, um, uh, uh, how that will precisely look. Um, it, we, we will be moving away from the, the, the plan update idea because we now have to uh, uh, think uh, and include in that uh, uh, green recovery um, a, a, a different set of, of, of issues. And you know there are some uh, potential. Uh, opportunities that we can take from where we are at the moment, and the transport secretary's announcement yesterday is an example of some of the things that might begin to emerge as significant questions that simply wouldn't have been couched in that way uh, in in the previous update. Um, but the um, uh, but the the work, I mean, a lot hinges on what we see from the CCC. Um, and I know the CCC isn't going to be advising only us; they're going to be advising the UK government as well. Uh, I mean, it's how we—it's how we can best see the way forward, and then a decision being made as to how that uh, uh, will then look, um, given the timescale that I'm um, indicating. I think is an appropriate one for us to do this piece of work. Um, so, uh, in, in terms of. Uh, the member's question. I, I, I can't say to him it will comprise ten chapters and it will cover, you know, the following things and we will do it in this way and that way because that is still um, work that needs to be done. Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose on on from that, uh, in your opinion, do you think that um, there will be any impact on what the CCC have always recommended, and that to tackle climate change we need to go further and faster? Well, COVID-19 put that uh, ambition at risk. And uh, finally, do you believe that we, we have seen uh, clear skies over our cities worldwide? Does the cabinet sector believe that the COVID-19 shutdown will have any long-term significant impact 
uh, on the UK or, or global climate? That last question might be a bit unfair, but I, I would like your opinion. Well, I, I don't think there's any doubt that in the in the very immediate sense, um, global emissions have probably um, decreased, and uh, I, I would have thought um, significantly. The images from uh, uh, huge parts of the world of the impact of the clean air um, is is one which is very striking. The 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 speed with which um, uh, wildlife um, have has moved back into areas of human habitation. Um, in a very short space of time is another um, pretty striking image that uh, uh, people are enjoying um, on social media. Um, uh, so I think what I would want to be a little careful of, and I would I would caution people should be careful of it, is is the need for um, a, a fairly um, a sensible analysis of of where we are with this, because um, we can point to some things that look like um, some pluses, and that, you know the the the, the, the uh, and, and we've talked about some of those already. But there will be other um, slightly more complicated issues that we have to deal with. The the, the transport issue that um, I referred to uh, by effectively commending the transport secretary's decision that he he announced yesterday um, uh, is a case in point. That was the plus side. Um, I would have, for example, a significant concern about the impact on public transport um, as we try to get back to um, some semblance of normality, um, and whether or not there is um, uh, uh, um, a, a, a kind of sense that people won't want to go back into um, uh, mass situations, mass public transport. We're not quite sure yet um, how that might look, and that's where. Uh, the potential for making a difference is a little bit more complicated than simply saying it's great that there aren't cars on the road. Look how clear everything is, and it's nice to get all this walking and cycling done. But but we need to think about what happens in terms of the role of public transport now uh, moving forward, um, uh, because there could be some um, very unintended consequences as a result. And that's where I find. To be absolutely crystal clear and honest, is it's not just quite as easy and straightforward as we might imagine um, uh, across a range of issues. There are some aspects of what we were deciding on before that I very much want to hold on to. The commitment to nature-based solutions, I think, is still um, uh, hugely uh, uh, important. Uh, I don't want to let go uh, of um, uh, of the importance of things like peatland restoration um, and tree cover for uh, for the future. I don't think we should imagine that somehow that's uh, 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 not going to continue to be part of it. And that's why I said the work that has already been done, in a sense, has been banked, and there's a considerable amount of it will still be relevant. It is how we think about those slightly more complicated issues that is going to really give us a sense of what we need to do in the future. Thank you. And now to questions from Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener um, and cabinet secretary. I very much welcome the statement and the clarity you've been able to give. Um, about the way forward um, on many of the issues that we, we're all dealing with in this committee and beyond uh, today. Um, I would say as a, as a, just briefly that I think a name change would be a, a concern for me um, because we all recognise the climate change plan um, and its update as what has come from the, the Act, and uh, I, I think um, that's something to consider. Anyway, I'll, I'll move to my questions quickly, um, and I'd like to just ask you how you see the um, interim report and ongoing work of the Just Transition Commission um, being able to feed into the updating of the Climate Change Plan the group, um, as well to contribute to equity being at the core of both of them. Thank you. Well, I think the Just Transition uh, Commission, and particularly the principles, are um, integral um, to to uh, to both sets of work to the economic recovery group as well as the um, uh, green economic recovery um, and you know the issue then becomes um, uh, 
uh, uh, how, how practical it is um, to task, to retask the Just Transition Commission in the current circumstances. They're, they're going to be challenged, as we all are challenged, uh, by what has happened. Um, and, uh, uh, but I do believe that they have an absolutely integral role to play, um, perhaps beyond anything that was envisaged for them um, uh, initially. Um, so uh, I, I think that their work um, is, is going to be critical in a lot of our thinking. Thank you. And if I may, convener, I've got another short question on the uh, on on the plan and also one on COP. Um, so, Cabinet Secretary, this has already been touched on by yourself uh, today. Um, and I wonder how do you see the lessons which can be built on um, uh, from the lower air pollution and less greenhouse gas emissions and return of nature, um, which will obviously help our health and that of the planet? Um, do you see those as things that the Scottish Government can highlight in terms of public awareness raising uh, and also of behaviour change, you know, leading to behaviour change, such as um, a possible walk to school rather than a car journey or some home working for those who can to cut congestion and stress levels and of course the benefits of virtual meetings such as this. Well, I mean, I think there are um, significant things um, uh, that may come out of this. Um, uh, we are all um, embedding new habits. Um, um, I suspect a considerable number of us are a good deal fitter than we may have been at the start of this because we're all taking our mandated exercise every day. Um, and by now, I suspect that is becoming a habit most of us will not want to let go of. So, um, yes, I do think there will be um, some aspects of this that we will uh, we will see um, embedded behaviour change that people will be very reluctant to let go of. Um, however, I did allude to a slight concern about some of the the other outcomes that there may emerge um, um, from from this, um, and uh, I think we need to be just a little bit careful um, about only seeing silver linings, because there will be um, some real conversations to be had about some aspects of 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 what may become the new normal, um, and uh, and how that is going to help us. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that the much reduced aviation emissions um, uh, may well be seen by many as as a um, as, as a plus. Um, I, I'm not an expert in the aviation industry, so I don't know what the likelihood is of them attempting to return um, to the status quo ante. Um, so there'll be lots of conversations in and around that aspect of uh, of things. So there are some pretty serious discussions and conversations that are going to be had about some aspects of this. And I've tended to focus mostly on transport because for me at the moment they're the ones that have have some of the real question marks uh, over them. But the, there is a kind of reconnection with nature arising out of the new habits that are being formed and the places where people are actually um, uh, taking their exercise that. Uh, may make some other messages that government um, and uh, campaigners try to get out there um, uh, land in a more receptive audience. Um, we shall have to wait and see whether that is the case, though. Right. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I've got a, a question about the uh, delay of the COP26. And I wonder if you could outline at all how it might be possible um, for Scottish Government and indeed us all to keep up and support the momentum of community, NGO and union involvement and connections here um, and also beyond Scotland um, in view of the delay? Well, the delay um, uh, has resulted in a certain amount of uh, um, move. The question that was asked much earlier about you know, um, resources, staff resources being directed into different places. So some of the um, some of the work around the COP26 continues, but you know, a certain degree of it has not. And I know that the postponement uh, impacts on a lot of the uh, um, uh, third sector that were in ENGOs and all the rest of it that were um, thinking and planning and targeting for uh, for November. Um, uh, I, I think most of them are committed enough to want to keep 
uh, that momentum going. But my suspicion in truth is that until we have some sense of when the rescheduled date is, it, it, it will be hard, harder to keep that on focus. And once we know when in 2021 um, they are considering uh, uh, for COP26, um, uh, that I think will re, uh, recharge all the batteries um, and will um, and will in those circumstances get all of that uh, going again. But of course, that does depend entirely on the management of the pandemic. And at this stage, it's extremely difficult to know what that is going to look like. Um, and you know, we are we are continually reminded that. Uh, life will not go back to the previous normal anytime soon, uh, and that may have other consequential impacts on even some of the bigger events that have been pushed forward into 2021. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Mark Ruskell. That's convenient. Questions. Um, perhaps I could start by asking Cabinet Secretary about the Climate Citizens Assembly. Uh, Mike Russell, Cabinet Secretary uh, in the Chamber yesterday, indicated that with the new COVID bill that's going to be brought to Parliament, there will be a change in the Climate Act. Um, I think to change the deadline of when the Climate Citizens Assembly will be reporting. Um, I, I mean, I understand some of the reasons for that, but I'm just a little concerned that. The work in terms of involving citizens in these questions around green recovery and climate change might slow down during this period. And I noticed that in France, their Climate Citizens Assembly is continuing to work. Um, it's continuing to develop new proposals, but it's working differently and it's working online. So I just I wanted just to get some clarity uh, from you, Cabinet Secretary, about what the government is proposing in terms of how that assembly is going to function, uh, and in particular, the kind of decisions that the stewarding group will be making about its remit uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Well, the stewarding group is uh, still working. Uh, in fact, I think they have uh, another meeting this week, so uh, I, I want the member to be absolutely clear that that, that work is ongoing. Um, as with many uh, things, um, this, uh, in Scotland, we have chosen to embed a lot of these things into, into legislation. Um, and, uh, and because the, the, the dates uh, uh, for certain things were on the, on the face of legislation, um, we had to consider whether or not it was actually achievable to do it in terms of the timescales that were uh, laid out. And, you know, I, I would remind people that the Citizens Assembly uh, on climate change was effectively designed to be up operating and having its final meeting uh, to coincide with COP26 in November. Um, and, uh, you know, it was quite clear that that was a, a, an unachievable end. Um, so uh, because it was on the, the, the face of primary legislation, we, we needed to, to change that. Um, I'm uh, of the view um, that uh, uh, there is a deal of work that can indeed be done um, uh, uh, online. Um, we are all having to become accustomed to this uh, way of working. We're all using Zoom um, and various other um, video conferencing uh, uh, platforms. Um, I think that uh, uh, the Citizens' Assembly, a, a considerable amount of uh, work might be uh, uh, done in, uh, in that way. Um, but the, the, the reason for the, the uh, inclusion of the um, uh, um, uh, clause in the, in the next emergency bill was simply so that we weren't breaching a statutory regulation. It's not about not getting on and doing the work. It's about understanding that in the current circumstances, the work couldn't be done within the timescale originally envisaged and legislated for uh, and to avoid us. Um, uh, breaching that legislative target, we need to um, adjust it uh, accordingly. Um, you know, there is a question, uh, I suppose, over the original intention to have the final meeting of the Citizens' Assembly at the uh, November COP. Um, depending on when the COP26 is postponed to, there may be a conversation about whether or not they still want to do the climate change uh, uh, the, the Citizens' Assembly to dovetail with the with the COP, or whether we accept that it will be done 
um, uh, earlier than that. Um, uh, so these are all uh, uh, conversations that will be ongoing, but they are, as I said, the stewarding group is meeting again this week, so they are live discussions. Mark, are you happy to move on? Um, I've got yeah, a, another. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think that's a useful response, I think, and obviously part of the context for the work of the Citizens Assembly is the climate change plan. Um, and as you've early indicated earlier, um, the intention of government is now to finalise that update by the end of this okay. year. So can I can I just ask then about the nature of that update? Um, in the act that we passed last year under section 35, Parliament added in a lot of uh, new areas for government to focus on with a climate change plan. I'm looking at it here, you know, agroecology, uh, home energy efficiency, electric vehicles, policy statements on oil and gas, district heating, just transition, climate justice. We felt the need to really bootstrap the bill in a number of areas. These were, you know, priority areas that we took evidence on and are now in that bill. There's nothing in the bill, though, to commit you to this update, uh, to working on those areas and to bring forward specific policies in those areas. But I surely you'd agree that it's within the spirit of the bill uh, to be working on those areas right now and to be bringing in new policies um, that can improve our uh, ability to tackle climate change and meet the targets and include those in the climate change plan update by the end of this year. I just wanted to get your views on that. I mean, are the, these priority areas that we identified under Section 35 going to be priority areas for the update, not just the formal requirements under a new climate plan? Well, um, first of all, I don't think anything I've said so far would suggest that I want to move away from the spirit of what uh, we have all agreed is necessary. Um, I have indicated um, that what we need to do is some serious analysis of where we are. Um, uh, my intention at the moment would be to include uh, um, the things that we had previously discussed uh, in, in committee. Um, uh, but obviously, we are in very, very changed circumstances. Um, and uh, uh, right now, the focus of government is pretty much on uh, combating um, this pandemic and the impacts of this pandemic on public health and on the immediate economy. Um, our work um, in terms of, uh, I'll call it the update, although we probably won't badge it that when we're actually doing it, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll begin to tease out um, some of the new realities that we are in and what the implications of those are for um, uh, many of the areas that the committee was uh, um, very keen on ensuring uh, uh, were included. But we're very, very clearly in a completely different fiscal and economic scenario than we were um, prior to this happening, which is why I felt the work had to be paused at the point it was paused, and why I think before we make absolutely final decisions about things, um, we make sure that we understand uh, all of the issues and consequences um, uh, that there might be. Um, but all of that uh, has to be kept under the umbrella of absolutely wanting to keep within the spirit uh, of what the committee had previously discussed. And also reminding us all that notwithstanding what has happened, we still have legislative uh, commitments to get to 75 percent emissions reductions uh, uh, by uh, 2030. They haven't gone away. They're still uh, the overriding uh, um, issue for us, and everything we do will still need to be uh, targeted towards that. Questions from Angus MacDonald. Okay, um, thanks, convener. Just, uh, just a quick question. Um, can, can, can I ask if the if the update or whatever it's to be titled is due towards the the end of the year, um, how will the Scottish government take uh, the Committee on Climate Change's 2030 75 75 percent advice into account, um, which is now due in December, uh, as part of the CCC's sixth budget? 
Well, I mean, these are all questions that we will have to to juggle. Um, uh, the timetable timetables across the board have been thrown out. Um, uh, I I I kind of feel that uh, um, trying to produce this um, uh, new like to call it um, by the end of the year helps um, committees to think about it in terms of the budget um, and therefore be aligned. Um, uh, uh, with that, I'm conscious that um, there are other uh, pieces of advice that uh, may land a little late in terms of uh, uh, where we want to be. But I'm afraid it is ever thus, because no matter when you make a decision that you're going to do something, there will nevertheless be uh, uh, um, a continued and rolling um uh, set of reports that could potentially impact uh, uh, on it. Um, th this is not ever a fixed point at which we can simply put a full stop um, and move on. It's a it's a constantly changing uh, world in which we are, and um, you know we have to try and think uh, to the best of our ability um, uh, what is needed at the time we are drawing this up. But you know the I would remind members that. That the climate change plan itself will have to be uh, uh, um, redone um, a, a couple of years later. So, you know, anything that comes out of time in terms of the update will nevertheless still be relevant for the the up, the, the the climate change plan itself, and that is a statutory uh, requirement. Okay. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, questions from Annie Wells. Thank you, convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, given that the circular economy bill has been delayed, obviously due to the global pandemic, will any of the policies that may have been implemented as part of that bill now appear in the climate change plan? Well, there will be obvious references to circular economy in the climate change plan. Um, the climate change plan um uh, uh update so the climate change plan is a, is a document produced um and what we had set out to be an update to that plan and what will now be green economic recovery will of course um have to consider uh circular economy as a key part of that um so yes in in that sense i mean that doesn't take the place of legislation for things that require to be legislated for um, so just to kind of so that we keep clear the, the differences between those uh, those two things. Um, uh, um, but uh, uh, yes, there will be um, uh, that that whole uh, circular economy mindset will be part of uh, um, any green economic recovery. Thank you, convener. Thank you. And uh, final questions to cabinet secretary on this. From Stuart Stevenson. Uh, Cab <clears throat> uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, obviously, the use of facilities in Glasgow for uh, the COP uh, are going to be in high demand uh, next year uh, and possibly for some time to come as a backlog of uh, events uh, is being renegotiated. Uh, have the Scottish Government secured? Uh, early commitments to the owners of facilities there to work with the government to make sure that we continue to have the facilities that we'll require for the COP? I, I think those conversations are rather difficult, absent um, any mm -hmm. indication of even a rough timetable for it. So um, I, I would anticipate that many of the um, uh, uh, locations that were uh, uh, already um, uh, being uh, secured for COP26 related events will know that they are likely to be in scope um, for a rescheduled COP. But until we're absolutely clear um, when that reschedule, uh, rescheduled COP will take place, it's very difficult to have anything other than an extraordinarily general discussion. Um, and uh, there will obviously be uh, timing issues um, uh, on a variety of different levels, 
both globally, um, UK-wide, Scotland-wide, Glasgow, um, that will all have to be part of the um, of what is factored into that. So, uh, no, um, we're not having very specific conversations about the potential uh, COP26. But those those um, those venues that were already being secured will undoubtedly be well aware that they will be the first in line for conversations the minute we know um, when uh, we're likely to have that rescheduled date. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I just said uh, that that really sums up all our, our questions on this. I, just, I want to thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for giving us that update. And it's very useful to remind us that in the background of the current crisis that we still have the global uh, climate emergency to, to, to deal with as, as well. So I want to thank you um, very much for that. That completes our questions and concludes the evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary. And I want to thank the Cabinet Secretary and officials for taking part in the meeting and, uh, and members as well. Uh, I think it's run very smoothly, which is a great relief to me, certainly. And that concludes the public part of this morning's meeting. The next meeting of the committee will be scheduled at an appropriate date, and that will be notified in the business bulletin and via the committee's social media. The committee will report on the regulations that we dealt with today on the 10th of May, and any follow-up scrutiny issues arising from the discussion of Scottish Government priorities will be dealt with uh, primarily by correspondence, which will be published on our website. So, as previously agreed, we are going to suspend this uh, meeting. That is the public part of the meeting closed, and I will see members uh, in another venue in 15 minutes after we have had a short break. Thank you very much.